For us, it is an honor to have you around here. Our wish is that the secrets of the sages of ancient India, taught by the renowned Yogi Sadguru, be a powerful tool of self-transformation in your inner journey. Get to know our yoga course by clicking on the link that is in the description of this video and learn more. When will you learn how to handle my thought, how to handle my emotion? We will give you tools how to figure this machine out. Whatever the issue, we'll do our best, but this should not be the issue. In life, there are many phrases where we feel that we are depressed, we are lonely, and when everybody is against us, and there is no one to, you know, guide us or talk about it. So at that moment, how should we handle it or how should we deal with it? See, uh, this is an unfortunate condition that a whole lot of human beings are in, in their experience. In their personal experience, life is like me versus the universe. Being in competition with the universe is a stupid thing to do. That's not a competition you must get into. Hello? Me versus the universe is a bad competition to get into, would you, you also agree with? <laughs> so, this is why yoga… Yoga does not mean twisting and turning your body. The word yoga means union. Right now it's me versus the universe. This is just your psychological condition, this is not the reality. Even when you feel utterly lonely, are you still breathing? So you're transacting with the world, isn't it? Yes? You only can't get along with the people around you, but atmosphere is okay with you, food is okay if it tastes good, water is okay. You have transaction with the world, isn't it? Your existence is constantly an engagement with the universe, but your mind becomes against the universe. If you create a psychological condition that you're against or you're in competition with the universe or the cosmos, obviously you will feel crushed for small things. Little things will crush you. When I say little things, maybe you failed your examination, maybe you got thrown out of this university, maybe you got fired from a job, maybe somebody ditched you, maybe something else like this happened. These are all small things between life and death. Because you came here with nothing, isn't it? When you die, there is no container service for you. You die with nothing. In spite of that, most people have turned their homes into warehouses. Most people are carrying such a huge baggage on their head, as if they are carrying the whole universe on their head. This is their own psychological condition. Your thought and emotion is what you're talking about, right? When are you going to figure out how to handle your thought and emotion? Not hers, not hers, not his, yours. When are you going to learn how to handle my thought and my emotion at the end of your life? The only problem really with life is just this. Most human beings have taken themselves too seriously. They don't understand You've seen on the computer screen these pop-ups? Yes. You are a pop-up on this planet <laughs> You pop up for two seconds and pop out. No, no, you must see, countless number of people like you and me have walked this planet. Oh, they were also big people. Where are they? All? Topsoil? Topsoil or no? Unless they… somebody, your friends decide to bury you real deep, <laughs> fearing that you may raise from the dead. <laughs> you know, there have been such instances. Or maybe you're planning to go to heaven. Hello? Anybody who talks about a place other than this place, as a better place than this, this is a crime against humanity. My fundamental work is to destroy all heavens so that people will learn to live well here. 
all these idiots who made a hell out of themselves, they want to go to heaven. They made a mess out of this place and then they want to go to heaven. I am asking you, do you have any proof? Do you have any proof that you are not already in heaven and messing it up? Do you have any proof? You are already in heaven, making a mess out of it, yes? Simply because you are not even learning how to handle your basic faculties of thought and emotion, isn't it? Your only justification is, everybody is like this only, that's how it is in a madhouse. That is how it is in a madhouse, only a doctor looks crazy. <laughs> so when are you going to handle it? Slowly, at the age of sixty, I'm asking, when will you learn how to handle my thought, how to handle my emotion, how to handle my body, how to handle my chemistry, when are you going to figure this? At the end of your life? Because this culture has grown, when to do spirituality means when you're seventy, when you're no good for anything else. No, at the earliest possible time, whatever is most profound about you, not about heavens, about this life, everything that you need to know, you must know soonest, isn't it? Only then you will live a sensible life. Okay, if I tell you a joke, you won't get offended. Because this is the most serious crowd I've ever seen in the last few years <laughs> How many of them are journalism? <laughs> most of them. Okay. <laughs> This happened. Shankaran Pillai, when he was in Paris, was mar married to a French woman. One day, uh, it was uh, their anniversary, first anniversary. So she w invited a bunch of friends and she wanted to cook something really fresh, everything fresh. So from morning, she was driving him to this market, that market, he got this fresh vegetables, fresh meat, fresh chicken, this, that, everything. Then in the evening she said, because the French have this, uh, you know, snail appetizer, she said, go to the beach and get some snails, fresh, and I will make some appetizer for all the friends who are coming. So Shankaran Pillai uh, went to the beach and he was picking up all the snails and putting it in a bucket. Then he met an old friend, an Indian guy. They hit it off and they were talking about their old times, he just forgot that he's married <laughs> You know, when you meet old friends it happens <laughs> And uh, both of them went to a bar and they had a few drinks and he just forgot. Then he realized, then the snails were just climbing out and talk one fa snail fell out of the bucket. He realized, oh my god, I'm supposed to take these snails, my wife, French wife. She's waiting. So he said, I need to go and he went. By then it was already very late. He went, he knew it's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> so he came near the house and spilled all the snails on the ground, threw away the bucket and uh, went and knocked on the door. The French fury came <laughs> He turned back and said, Come on, you guys, we're almost there, come on, let's go <laughs> So, when are you going to pick your snails and put them in the bucket and fix them? Huh? Your problems, you must fix them, isn't it? These are not problems. I want you to understand you are not suffering your life. You're only suffering two fantastic faculties that only… It's a privilege of being human that we have these two fantastic faculties. One is, we have a vi vivid sense of memory. This is because of this memory our life is so rich, unlike any other creature. And we have a fantastic sense of imagination. Now, this is what you're suffering. What happened ten years ago, you can still suffer. Why? Are you suffering life or memory? Hello? Memory. memory. What may happen day after tomorrow, you're already suffering? E are you suffering life or imagination? imagination? Two most fantastic faculties you have, you're suffering.
So what are you asking for? You want to become once again an earthworm. An earthworm is a very eco-friendly creature, I have nothing against it. But it took millions of years of evolution to get you a this size of brain and now you're suffering it. If we take away half your brain, of course you will sit there without any anxiety, without any suffering, peacefully. <laughs> what we need is we need to remove your brain because you're suffering your own intelligence. Yes or no? Because we gave you a very complex machine, you have not bothered to read even the user's manual. You want to just blunder around. No, young people, it's time you figure out a few things about you. If you don't know how, we will give you tools how to figure this machine out. Because in your life, many issues will come. More issues come up in your life means you're living a more active life. Nothing came up means you're not living, yes? Lots of issues every day. I have the maximum number of trouble going on in my life on a daily basis <laughs> because so much of activity around the world, global level of activity only with volunteers, okay? Volunteers means nobody is qualified for the job and you can't fire them for inefficiency <laughs> and they love you. What to do? This one thing you must fix, that is, in your life, you are not the issue, okay? Whatever the issue, we'll do our best, but this should not be the issue. Whatever your state of mind has been from your childhood to now, need not be the state of your mind for the rest of your life. Find something that you're passionate about, you need to develop some intensity of attention will naturally come. The easiest thing to do is change the framework of our mind. See, when it comes to physical body and the mind, no two human beings have come with the same capabilities, isn't it? Hmm? Physically, mentally, what one human being can do, another human being cannot do, it's in so many different ways. So instead of getting a title that I'm attention deficiency, I'm ADD, ABC, XYZ, <laughs> so many things. <laughs> the thing is, how to maximize who you are, isn't it? You have attention deficiency, but I had another kind of problem, I had too much attention. <laughs> if I pay attention to this one, I can't shift my attention to this, I'm just looking at this only for hours. <laughs> that also people thought is a problem. People thought it is a problem, he's just looking at one thing all the time. I remember this situation so well, it was so insane. You know, my father is uh, academically excelled all his life, but unfortunately, he produces a son like me, <laughs> who has no concern about academics of any kind. So he thinks he's a very strict disciplinarian and evenings, Seven to nine, every day in the evening, we must all, the four siblings, all of us must study Tch, textbook. I pick up some textbook because it doesn't matter for me what. <laughs> and I open somewhere. I don't care which page, I just open some page. And I, s I find some small speck on the page, a tiny speck, some flaw in the paper. I just look at that, that's about it. <laughs> it just grabs my attention in such a way, 
I just sit there two hours just looking at this speck. I don't read a single word, but I never looked up and looked here and there because it really held my attention. Two hours I'm just looking at the speck because there is so much in a bloody speck, you know? There's an entire world in a speck. People have spent their lifetimes looking after a microscopic molecule or an atom, isn't it? Speck is much bigger than an atom. So, people thought I was going crazy because I had too much attention. So, don't go on labeling yourself this and that. Who… who decides you have attention deficiency? Huh? Is there some standard how much attention you must have <laughs> or how much attention you must get? <laughs> there is no such standard anywhere, isn't it? You're making it up. The problem is uh, right from childhood children are labeled and they are supposed to carry this label for the rest of their life. What level of attention you have at five? What level you may have at six, at seven, at eight, at fifteen or twenty? Can be entirely different. Haven't many of you evolved through this process? Huh? Haven't you? First day school you couldn't figure a damn thing, maybe later on you did well. Or maybe first day you look like you understood everything, by the end of the year you did nothing. <laughs> yes or no? <clears throat> you… you're a young man, there are girls in the neighborhood <laughs> hmm? I'm a mechanical engineer, so… No, that's okay <laughs> I'm… I'm a mechanical engineer. Are there girls in the neighborhood, I asked <laughs> No, engineers generally tend to have uh, neighborhoods which do not have a lot of girls, so <laughs> They must be moving away for some reason <laughs> Where does this come from, mechanical engineer? <laughs> Mechanical in the head <laughs> So, you're at a certain age, now you get drawn to somebody, you don't have to concentrate, isn't it? Hello? You don't have to concentrate. They will invade. So it is only a level of interest. If you have a deep level of interest in something, attention will come. Why will it not come? You still have not found any interest in anything. I don't know which part of the mechanics you're handling in London <laughs> I heard the clock is not working. So, if you become <coughs> profoundly drawn to something, why will you not have attention? Attention will come. Do I have as much attention as somebody else? Maybe not. I never had any attention for what was happening in the classroom, but I didn't find that interesting. I was… but my attention was in all kinds of things. Does it mean to say I don't have a… I have attention deficiency? No, I'm not interested in what they're putting up on the blackboard. That's all <laughs> So right now, unfortunately, all the girls have moved out of the neighborhood <laughs> So you have attention deficiency. Find something that you're passionate about, attention will come. Why will it not come? 
not necessarily what I said, just anything <laughs> I'm taking that example of a girl because there is a chemical support. <laughs> yes, there is a chemistry working for your attention. Other things need little more effort to pay attention to. <laughs> You need to develop some intensity of passion, that's something that is important. What you think is important, <laughs> if this comes into your perspective, attention will naturally come. I know others will say other things, but what I am telling you is, whatever your state of mind has been from your childhood to now, need not be the state of your mind for the rest of your life. The easiest thing to do is change the framework of our mind, isn't it? Hmm? To change the framework of our body is very difficult. To change the framework of our mind is the easiest thing to do because that is the most flexible thing. But that you have made it like a concrete block. What do you want to use your head for? Just head butting? <laughs> <laughs> you must keep this as flexible as possible, isn't it? Hello? Yes. You have made this into a con concrete block, what is the intention? That's why I think so many are… S I mean, the, the such passionate football fans, the only <laughs> thing that you appreciate is this <laughs> That is also a good thing when it's done well, but… Head can be used for many more things and you can do many more things only if you keep it completely fluid and flexible. Otherwise, a concrete block is useful only for certain things. So it doesn't matter what labels they put on you. If you wish, you can change the structure of your mind. praises and every day visits the temple. They took a, a small piece of wood, boom, hit on each person's head. He screamed in pain. The linga that everybody worships, his feet were on it and he was lying down. The yogi said, that's all, go home. There was a great sage, a well-known, even today, hugely celebrated sage whose name was Namdev, who came from the present state of Maharashtra. He was a devotee of Vithoba or Vithala. Vithala is one form of worship which uh, this temple in Pandrapur kind of galvanized a whole devotional movements. And Namdev stands out in that. So every day he is a devotee, he sings God's praises and every day visits the temple, spends long time there. He is already known in the town as a very great devotee. So one day somebody looks at him and they say, see, all your devotion is fine, but still you have not realized anything, you're not enlightened. So Namdev got picked. How do you say, I'm not enlightened, I'm just living for God. Every word I utter is of God. How can you say, I am not? He said, see, outside uh, the town today, under this particular tree, a few yogis have gathered. Many of them are enlightened beings. Maybe you should go and sit among them, you will realize what you lack. You're becoming a celebrated devotee, all right? Slowly people are celebrating you more than the God. 
<laughs> so you must go sit there. So Namdev said, what's my problem, let me go on. He went and sat there. About ten, twelve were there and uh, then this person who had suggested this, I think it's time we test out in this group who is a, you know, Kachagada, who is an unburnt pot? How do you find out who is an unburnt pot among these twelve, thirteen people who are sitting there? So they took a, a small piece of wood, a plank, a thin plank, and went and boom, hit on each person's head by the sound. They will know who is an unburnt pot. When they came and hit Namdev, he screamed in pain. Then they said, ah, this is an unburnt pot. Then Namdev felt deeply insulted, humiliated among people. And then he asked, what should I do? They said, all your devotion is fine, you're doing well on that area, but there's no realization here, you need a guru. He asked, who is that guru? They said, uh, see, if you go like this in this jungle, there is one little temple. There, there is a yogi, he is the best guru for you. He went there with a lot of uh, reservations, he went there. When he went and saw, the guru was lying down with his feet on the deity or the linga that was there. The, the linga that everybody worships, his feet were on it and he was lying down and enjoying the afternoon. Namdev saw this and he was aghast. He is a devotee. He cannot, he doesn't even, you know, in India most people won't even stretch their legs towards this. They will never stretch their legs towards me. Because that is considered highest level of disrespect. In a temple they will never ever sit like that. But here this yogi is putting his feet on the linga and lying down. Then uh, Namdev became very angry. And he said, what is this nonsense? You got your feet on the sacred linga and they tell me I must learn from you? The yogi said, oh, is it my feet are on the linga? I didn't realize. Do one thing, I'm so very tired, can you just, you know, take my legs and put it this way? So Namdev lifted his legs and put it this way. Where he put his feet, there another linga came up. Oh, I'm sorry, once again on the linga, put it here. He again moved it here, another linga came up. Wherever he put it, one linga came up. Then Namdev looked at him completely bewildered. The yogi said, that's all, go home. And then Namdev went home and he never, never went to the temple. People said, what happened to your devotion? You did not went to the temple? He said, I was a fool, I thought he was only in the temple. Now I see him everywhere, so I don't have to go to any particular place. I will go to the temple when I need to, I have no problem with that. But for me, wherever I look, he is there right now. This is what consecration means. Living in a consecrated space means that wherever you look, whatever you touch, should feel like divine. Hmm? To create such a space at home, here as a thing. Because when we create here, some of you will just smell it and go. It's good, it's a very good smell. You will just smell it. Smell it means I want you to understand. Suppose food comes, mmm, with the smell, then the mouth starts watering, then you have to ingest. If we just show you the nice smell of the food and take it away, uh, there's no nourishment, there's pleasure but no nourishment. Then some will eat once in a way, so once in a way partake in what we refer to as sacred or divine essentially intensified life, core life. Or you soak in it, these are the choices. 
Whatever your choices, they are your choices. If you think you have a very long life, you can come once in a way, partake in it and go, it's fine because we know one way or the other you will spread it. If you want to soak in it, if you understand, you are a mortal life, life is not forever, you want to soak in it, then such possibilities are there. We will be creating various opportunities where people can live and work, work and live here, create their own office spaces and live here, various ways. Many, many possibilities we will unfold in the next uh, twelve months or eighteen months. Slowly the unfolding of this will happen. The idea is maximum number of people should soak in the divine, not just have a little... Uh... The soul exists. Soul? Yes. Who's soul? And one more, what, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> You're just asking very big questions without understanding the significance of the question. See, when you ask, does soul exist, you're not talking about an academic subject. You're asking, what is the nature of who I am? Or you're saying, I don't know a damn thing about myself, please tell me. Yes? Isn't it? You're asking this very easily because you have not been touched by the pain of ignorance, the pain of not knowing who you are, it has not torn you apart. If it really touches you that you are just living here, doing all kinds of nonsense without knowing the A, B, C of who you are, it should be very painful, isn't it? That pain has not yet touched you. You're mouthing questions, it's not sunk deep enough. So every day you must remind yourself, at least spend ten minutes in the morning, just see what an utter idiot you are. You don't know anything about yourself, but you're busy with all kinds of nonsense in your life. Every day, just ten minutes, remind yourself as intensely as possible your ignorance of yourself. Then slowly the pain will sink. When it becomes so painful, that you can't bear it, knowing will not be far away, it's one moment. If I say, yes, you have a soul, but can you walk better? What use is the soul? Did they put any kind of utility to the soul? These two are useful. That other soul that they are talking about, is it of any use? It's of no use, so don't talk about it. And if I tell you it is there, what does it do to you? If I tell you, no, it doesn't exist, what does it do to you? Nothing, isn't it? Only thing is the next dinner party that you go, you can entertain people around you talking about the soul. But as far as your existence is concerned, nothing changes, isn't it so? Yes? Nothing at all will change, isn't it? So if you're asking the question, Fundamentally, you are asking a question, what am I, who am I? When you are here, here, are you alive? You are alive. When you are here alive, what is the way to know who you are? Is it not really ridiculous and insane that you must ask me, please tell me who am I? This is like two psychiatrists were walking on the Kovalam beach one day. 